Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's an interactive program. And tonight we are focusing on what many people consider to be the pulse of the nation, education. We have the Minister for Education joining us to share his thoughts on very important things within the sector that he oversees. We'll come back and talk to him right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back. So tonight on The Point of View, we've managed to drag Dr. Osei Duchum out of Parliament because we know from what's happening in Parliament that members of ministers who are members of Parliament are needed in the floor of the chamber. But we've caught up with him to ask him some questions, not just about what's happening in Parliament in respect of how much will be allocated to the ministry, but on his vision for the sector. We know he was the deputy minister in the previous administration. He's been appointed substantive minister. He's been talking a lot about STEM education. He's been excited about NSMQ. And there have been issues also in education across the country. Tonight, he'll tell us what his vision is, what he hopes to do, what he started already, and how, within the next three years, he hopes to transform education. Doc, thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I noticed you've been wearing black these days for the past few weeks. Is it because of your, your mother? My mom. Wow. Awesome. So she's not been buried yet? No. So you're actually in mourning? Yes. Condolences. Thank you, sir. I lost my dad last year. It's very tough. And I'm sure mothers are tougher. Can imagine. Wow. <laughs> do you get time to do constituency? Because I think your sector is the biggest. Yes. Um, but let me go back to something you mentioned, the pulse of the nation, education, that keeps me excited. And um, yes, my constituents are very understanding. I have a chairman who, of the party who is so good and dedicated. I'm so lucky to have a lawyer assuming as my DCE who steps in for me and do whatever we are supposed to do together. So it's been very helpful. Mm. Um, so we're getting work done there at the constituency level. And the national level, as you just said, there's a lot to be done. Mm. Education is the pulse of the nation. <laughs> you, should, you should credit me with that saying. <laughs> of course. <laughs> when we look at parliament, because of the closeness of the numbers, mm -hmm. it's going to be increasingly required for you and other cabinet ministers mm -hmm. to be there. Mm -hmm. That didn't seem to be the case before. How are yes. you adjusting to that? Uh, the first term was a luxury. Now we can't afford that luxury anymore. Uh, so it's interesting, especially when you are the substantive minister. And you have to be on the floor. You have to worry about what is going on in your ministry. Um, and then you have to look at your constituency. So it's, it's a Herculean task. Uh, but uh, with the help of God, I think we'll pull it through. We know this week and the previous week have been hectic in Parliament. On the education side, uh, have the appropriation hearings been held for your sector? Where are we with that? Yeah, we've done the hearings two days. Um, and, and yesterday was the final day. And the committee is writing its report. I think uh, both sides of the aisle, uh, NDC and PP, understand the enormity of the responsibility when it comes to education. Um, I've had some very good education committee members, NDC, MPP. Uh, for the first time in my hearing, Apak agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Apak. Clement Apak. He agreed with you. Oh, yeah. He said, now nah, I agree with him <laughs> on transformation of junior high schools. So um, we work together. We disagree. There are times when we agree. So let me get, how does it work? I know there's a budget committee of some kind. Mm. So is it that the education committee members come together to defend or is it you who goes to defend your budget how how does the appropriation happen the, the first thing you go before the education select committee and uh -huh. you defend your budget okay once they come to a consensus they come to the floor to defend the budget okay so this and is so members from education, education both sides both sides okay so, uh, they ask you good questions you answer mm. they may do follow-up but when they agree and it comes to the floor invariably on the floor of parliament it is their recommendation just a final point here with all the shenanigans going on in parliament if it happened that the budget did not get passed how much of a setback would it be particularly for a sector that affects everybody every day i i, I believe we're going to get a budget part but just like you said uh, this education budget i believe um it's one of the best we've ever seen and 
without the passage of the budget, the, the loss to the country will be enormous. Not just shutting down the entire education system, but you're talking about some unique opportunities for transformation that is embedded in this budget, which will not happen. Uh, so I, I think as we move forward, we're going to have the opportunity to speak to someone. But let me just mention five science, technology, engineering, mathematics universities, five STEM universities, part of this budget. For this year or for? Uh, for this year. Starting this year. The starting this year. And you have 35 STEM high schools, 10 of which will start in the upcoming budget year, 2022. So these are all new? Yeah. You have 20, 12 state-of-the-art TVET uh, schools, uh, just like replicating KTI 12 times. And the 35 STEM schools is just like building Presec 35 times, going to be distributed across the country uh, so that we can increase the number of students graduating for, with STEM background. So, mm. uh, so far as I'm concerned, this is one of the best budgets for education. So let's go through this. Republic. You have 12 new TVET uh, yeah. schools, mm -hmm. 35 STEM high schools yes. and five STEM universities. universities and then 100 million for new uh, junior high schools or lower secondary schools. That will give about 20 at minimum, 20 new transformed uh, environments for lower secondary education. Some, some, if the, I like the Presec example, but when Presec was founded in 1938, mm -hmm. I happen to have gone to Presec. Mm. Oh, yes. Okay. The, the idea was it was a normal secondary school mm. until the 70s when they made it a science school. So can, could that not be the approach to make it faster? Because you're going to build 35 schools from scratch. Mm. What, what, what about saying, for example, picking Sunyani SHS, mm. St. James Seminary, Opokuwari, mm. Presec and say, or other schools and say, we are converting you. Wouldn't that be quicker? I mean, we've done some of that. There are a number of schools now, uh, for example, 12 senior high schools that are going to be operationalized this upcoming academic year called the Kufuadu V blocks. Beautiful schools. You go to Abomosu. Some people will say, why don't you make this a university? Top of the line schools. And these are all opening this academic year. Uh, so it's, and, and each one of the schools have 12 science labs. And even the Creative Arts Senior High School in Kwadasu has 12 science labs. Because I don't want the idea that it's for creative art students and therefore they don't do science. You know sci-fi movies. Mm -hmm. uh, movies can have serious scientific backdrops. Consequently, even the creative art senior high school coming down the pike have 12 science labs. So we have about um, these schools that are coming with all the complement of a science school, like Presec. And on top of that, we're going to get the 35. Uh, which is going to get you various STEM pathways, aviation, aeronautical sciences, you're going to do computer programming, web page design. So what we're going to do is that the science STEM pathway may be about four. So when you add it all together, we're going to have a school where about 70% are all focused on STEM, and that's how you bring up the number. But yes, if you look at a school like um, uh, Manfred Methodist Girls, it's a school we are targeting to become a STEM school. Because of the foundation there, the headmistress who came to the school and changed the school into a school that does robotics, I think it makes sense to look at schools like that and say, why don't I improve their science capacity uh, so that they can do more? But we also know that we have limited financial resources, and that is why we want to go the way of other countries around the world where they are doing virtual labs. So where you cannot do wet labs, uh, you go virtual. Okay. A simulated lab environment. So you can literally take a school and change it into a science school without necessarily building more So you are doing both? We are doing both. Two key points about allocation. Mm. Because of uh, the increased number of students in mm. secondary schools, mm. there appears to be a strong infrastructure need mm. for the boarding schools. They need more facilities. The other issue we noticed was because the students are more, mm. you need more teachers on campus. Mm. So some of the schools, for example, we went to Sue School, mm. and they don't have many on-campus teachers. teachers. One would have thought we would have seen allocation for more bungalows for some of the senior mm. high schools, more dormitories. From what I've seen from the appendices, I don't mm. see allocation for that. You see, uh, interesting thing about budgeting in Ghana is the fact that there are certain things you don't see here, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay. You see, uh, get funds budget is coming later. Okay. 
So all the infrastructure development that Get Fund is doing, you don't see it here. All right. And and when you go to the Get Fund, mm. where we had 1.5 billion, 500 million has been used, the rest, the billion, is going into infrastructure overhaul, but it doesn't find expression on the page. So of you are, so are you telling me on, on authority that the question I ask about mm. more classrooms, mm. more dormitories, yes. and teacher bungalows, Get yeah. Fund will take care of it. Oh yes. I mean, if you look at last year's allocation mm. in the, what they call the Get Fund formula, mm -hmm. the Get Fund formula goes to Parliament and it specifies all the things that you are using Get Fund funding for. And in that, you're going to see the infrastructure expansion, the continuation of that. Uh, so, so when you look at this, the regular budget have what you call capex, right? So sometimes so limited. So people who do analysis of budget will tell you the government is not investing in infrastructure. But when you go to the support from donor agencies and um, um, other loans and grants that are coming through and then you look at the get fund allocation you're going to see that's a huge investment in infrastructure but you don't find it on the pages of this budget because that is how the law says and that is how things are done since we are still on the budget in october teacher trainees were complaining about arrears for mm -hmm. their uh, for six months mm -hmm. i also know that a lot of public sector workers have mm -hmm. not been happy with base pay issues mm -hmm. A lot of them are in your sector. Mm. What is your message for teacher trainees in relation, in relation to their allowance mm. and teachers and continuous of service as far as the budget is concerned? Uh, what I'll tell you is that the budget actually increased the amount for allocation to teacher trainees because of the increase in their numbers. Uh, but beyond that, the past, uh, this almost past year's allocation, funds have now been released for uh, disbursement to colleges of education in regards to um, the allowances. So teacher trainees are going to be very happy soon. Uh, a substantial part of it has gone out to them, and we are pushing to ensure that by the time they return to school, the past year's obligations will be made whole, and then we can uh, look at going forward in terms of the new budget allocation. Let's talk about WASI results. Mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, some people have been very quick to tout the success of free SHS mm -hmm. by looking at mm -hmm. 2020 and 2021. Right. I mean, you are an education of many years. Mm. Is that is that the best way of analyzing trends in student achievement? I ask because every exam is different, mm. and two years out of mm. probably a 20-year educational mm. system may be mm -hmm. too quick to conclude. Mm. Is that not the case? Um, it will have been the case if people are not shooting you down <laughs> everywhere you find mm. yourself. So, so uh, the, the point of the matter is this. You have a system which since 2015 has not delivered, right? Um, if you look at the percentage of students who are attaining, um, they want to see this in the four core subjects. 2016, it didn't happen. Four core subjects, there was nothing close to 50%. 2016, nothing close to 15% across the world. 2017, 2018, 2019 is where we got three subjects uh, which had 50% uh, plus. And then you go to 2020, and you have all four core subjects 50% uh, plus. 2021, all core subjects 50% uh, uh, plus. If you happen to be the Minister for Education, what are you going to say? Especially given the backdrop, you heard of this doom and gloom of people saying double track has collapsed the education system, everything has fallen apart, things are so bad, uh, adults were making fun of the double track and the new education system, based on the premise that in education, invariably, when you increase access, quality suffers. So their premise was right, but if you're educationist, you also know that you have to do certain kind of intervention so that quality doesn't suffer. So we were able to inoculate the system very well against the idea of a drop in quality as a result of increase in access. Because around the world, it happens. So you're admitting that some of this has just been in response to criticism, but that if, for example, you were doing a long-term analysis of the educational sector and performance, you probably need a lot more information for some sort of policy conclusion? No. Uh, and the reason I'll say no is that when you see the trend from 2018 going upwards, right, I'll conclude that things are getting better. I could argue that it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the case. I agree mm -hmm. with you when you mm -hmm. say for the first time in all four core subjects, yeah. everybody has more than 50%. Yes. 
But you could also argue that for mm -hmm. certain subject areas, mm -hmm. 2021 was mm -hmm. worse than 2020. No, but you see, the significance And you could even say that 2020 no, no, was the, worse than 2019 no, no, for no, some no, core subject no, areas. But the significance of the 50% is what is called the A1 to C6 for university entrance. Mm -hmm. If you go to 20, uh, 2015, mm -hmm. what was the lowest score there? I think so mathematics is 32, uh -huh. integrated science 28, very English good. language 45, very social good. studies 57. So mathematics being 32 means that not more than 32% of that year's graduates can go to the university. Because all those who did not get mathematics will not, because of the D7 issue, will not be able to go. So you cut down on the university entrance substantially because of the 32. It really doesn't matter if one subject was 90%. Even if every subject was 100%, because of that 32, less than 32, 32% um, uh, or less can have access to tertiary education. So, so the moment you hit 50%, it really doesn't matter whether it was 54, 52. So 50, but it's 50 percent some magic number. Yeah, because Why it, it, it guarantees opportunity because of our D7 issue. It guarantees opportunity when you get the mathematics and English over 50 percent. It guarantees the opportunity for more to go. So, but, uh, but aren't you concerned that, for mm -hmm. example, social studies, the number for 2019 was mm -hmm. 75, uh -huh. and it's come down to 64 for 2020, no, I, I'm, I'm not concerned. I'm focusing on how many people will qualify to go to the university. And consequently, if you really want to look at the quality, you have to look at the 50% and say, did we make it for all subjects? That is the Fair the, enough. The but important. when we go into yeah. Salamat's report, mm -hmm. beyond the Ghana trend, mm -hmm. there's also the comprising to other West African countries mm -hmm. in the WASI system. Mm -hmm. and. Nigeria seems to be doing so much better than us. Mm -hmm. In, for example, for core maths, they had 75, we are 67. Mm -hmm. English, they are 76, we are 57. Mm -hmm. For biology, mm -hmm. they had 84, uh -huh. we have 68. Mm -hmm. To think that they have 1.5 million and we mm -hmm. have about 400,000, that's very serious. That suggests we are not competitive within the sub region compared to Nigeria. That should be of concern to you. Uh, uh, I think you've heard me talk about lower secondary. And I always use that to make a distinction between junior high and lower secondary. Because in this country, we seem to think that junior high is not part of secondary. And in fact, I, 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 another station, maybe I don't have to mention their name. They have misreported on this. TV3 have just said that I'm saying that senior high should be six years. Okay. They forget that secondary includes junior high. Once upon a time, secondary education was seven years. 1987 education reform made it six years. But the downside to the 1987 education reform is when, instead of making the lower secondary or junior high true high, they relegated it to the old middle school buildings. No science lab, no computer lab, nothing that says it is a high school, but we never look back and consign the fate of students in the lower secondary area to run down the lapidated building that we used to call middle school, part of the elementary school. Consequently, unlike Nigeria, that have put most of their schools under one umbrella, the lower secondary, upper secondary coexisting. We separated lower and, and upper secondary, or junior high and high school, used the American model. But what we forgot was that in the American model, even though they are not co-locating, they have similar facilities. So the junior high has similar facilities and equipment and tools as the high school. Same teacher qualification as the high school. They are not wearing, junior high is not wearing the uniform where they wear uniforms with the primary school students. So what the president is directing that we do is to look at this, the weakest link of our education system which happens to be the junior high, make sure there's a parity, and consequently get the six year that Nigeria is enjoying. But by the way, if you're looking at top performing students that get eight A1s, you're going to find them in Ghana. But, but, based but on, not Nigeria, but, but the average... But based on your 50% argument, average, they that, do that better. is defeated. Because no, no. Your, your argument is that uh -huh. we need more people to get in. So no, even no, though I'm they may not have extremely I have, brilliant students, have to make if 75% of them pass, it's better have, than... I have to make the caveat. You say that when the black stars play and they win, the whole country jubilates. I want Ghanaians to have something to jubilate about. 
that yeah, but in your example, we are looking for we can, we, can have the, we can have the best player in the tournament, uh-huh. but uh-huh. somebody else wins the the cup. No, no, it happens. <laughs> but I'm not as a Ghanaian going to sit here and say that eight A ones I should mention. No, I get it. I get it. But <laughs> just a couple of questions to clarify. Mm-hmm. So maybe the reportage was confused because now people are getting to understand this piloting of the six year secondary school. Mm-hmm. A couple of things. So how will you manage the the issue of say logistics. Mm. So let, let's let's flex for example presec has a presec basic. Mm. They are on the same campus, that's mm. fine. Achimota is the same. Mm. But you may go to Prempe and they may not have Prempe basic. Mm. How does a a basic school within the precincts of Prempe benefit from the excellence of Prempe College? I think that's the idea of this six year the, what, what Nigerians did was that is the junior high that co located with the senior high. So not they the moved primary. yes, not the primary. So, so there, there are two ways of doing, three ways of doing this. Mm-hmm. In your new schools, you can decide that if you have built a new senior high school, let's say Frafraha Community Day, the junior high schools in the area will be co-located there because they have access to library, to science lab, and other activities. You can also say that I don't worry about co-location. Let me put up a junior high school facility that has everything that a high school has, and in order to use economies of scale, instead of 200 students, 100 students, and in some communities, there are 12 junior high school, and some of them are 80 students, 100 students, every one of them has a headmaster. But you cannot provide a science lab for each one of those schools. But if you were to bring, amalgamate them, and put up one building that will accommodate 1,000 students, you can bring eight schools together in mm. one location. Mm. That's another way of maintaining the parity. Mm. So even if you go by the American model where there's no co-location, you can still bring about parity so far as the junior high school has everything that a high school that, that is great mm-hmm. except if we assume that mm-hmm. the better quality mm-hmm. teaching and mm-hmm. supervision is in the senior high mm-hmm. when you go back to salaman's report mm-hmm. he does a place he calls value addition mm-hmm. so whereas some of the big secondary schools mm-hmm. wesley girls and all these have mm-hmm. good grades mm-hmm. it's actually because they get good products when he actually did the value addition mm-hmm. A lot of schools in BA, like Sunyani High School, actually the best ones. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to understand how this is going to work. So if somebody thinks, I have a child in Sofo Line GHS, mm-hmm. let them go and benefit from Prempe's excellence. Mm-hmm. Actually, Sunyani SHS has better value mm-hmm. than Prempe does. Mm-hmm. So is, 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 are we not missing out on that insight in this policy? No. I'm just saying that there are different ways of looking at it. I'm not saying put junior high schools at Prempe. I'm saying... Mm. that there are different ways of getting to where Nigeria is. Mm-hmm. And one of the best ways, to me, is when you put up a junior high school that has the same facilities as a senior high. It doesn't have to be on the same premises of a senior high school. It doesn't have to be. But it gives you value that those students going to high school are better prepared because they've used science lab. They know how science labs work. So there are different ways of coming to that destination. I'm not in any way advocating that add a junior high school to Prempe. No, that may not be the best formula. Okay. Uh, the best formula is making sure, irrespective of where the junior high school uh, students find themselves, short term, long term, we need to upgrade where we have to use mobile labs, where we have to use vis- uh, virtual labs, even if we don't add to the facility. The virtual lab opportunity should be there. So the whole idea is that we shouldn't confuse the fact that junior high school is also part of secondary education. Okay. And therefore, we should do everything possible to make sure uh, the high, junior high school, which I believe in our current dispensation is the weakest link in our education system, is equipped. And that is what uh, the president has directed that we do. And that is why it finds expression in the budget in terms of new uh, junior high schools. On infrastructure, I remember the minority complained mm-hmm. about the e blocks, mm-hmm. and the PRO came to clarify that of the 200 e-blocks that were started no I, they actually started 124 yeah 124 propose, with 50 51 yeah and 101 my, my question is have the proposed 200 been finished or is it so what number is the government working with in terms of e-blocks we inherited 24 124, 124. at various stages of completion uh-huh. and by the time we came about 20 i think 27 had been completed and we've I think it's 29 29 yes and we've added more this same fact that clue and other schools have been completed so we are close to about 30 plus in terms of the one that has been completed under our watch another phase that we are looking at and has been doing under the direction of the president is if you look at a school like Drobonsu 
it's completed. Mm -hmm. But it's located in a place where it's impossible to operationalize unless you add a boarding facility. So we've also added boarding facility. You look at Ansaura. The school has been completed. There are a number of students there, but they have a huge challenge because the children are coming from villages. Boarding facilities have been added. So that is another dimension that whenever you see um, uh, an e-block, that cannot be operationalized. You have to add boarding facilities so that it can be fully operationalized. These are the resources of the country. But, so, but will, you finish, will you finish the 124? I mean, we are working on it every year when resources come. Because you see, they, whenever I get this question, I just want to take a few minutes to educate Ghanaians on it. The e-blocks, 124 that were started, only 23 has dedicated funds. 23 from Secondary Education Improvement Project. Mm -hmm. It has dedicated funds. It was easy to execute, even though about 13 of them had been completed when we took over. The rest of it, the money was there. So it was just managing to make sure you finish. All the rest, there were no dedicated budget source, which we can do these days. <laughs> these days you can't. Uh, any project that you're going to do, you have to make sure in education there's money set aside. But during their time, they did something that has led to this crisis of some people saying, my e-block has not been done. The 23 that had budget allocation has not been completed because the money was set aside for it. So for the ones that there wasn't money, have you found new money to finish? No, no, of course. We've been com in fact, a number of them has been financed, and I did a report on the floor of parliament, a number of them have been financed with the bond money from the 1.5 billion that we sought uh, from Parliament, sought approval for Parliament. So, so a number of them have been completed. This year we're going to open some of them. But the bottom line is that if you don't have the money sitting there and you are doing the whole construction, the way I always say, my father cocoa farmer built his house. Every year you have some cocoa and you dry and you take some money and then you add on. That's how we buy education. So. When you do it that way, it's difficult to mm. complete it in a timely fashion. So when people say, why are you not, why are you not doing this? My question is, we, 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 we really did bite more than we can chew. Mm. And it has to take time for it to be finished. This is the point of view. We're talking to Minister for Education and MP for Bosom Che, Honorable Yao Osei Duchum, trying to understand not just whether we have money for all our ideas in education, but also his vision for the sector. We'll also deal with some challenges that have come up, some of which he inherited, some of which are new. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we're talking education. Our guest, Dr. Osei Aiduchum, Minister for Education, Substantive Minister, also MP for Bosom Tree. Busy, busy times in Parliament, very large ministry, lots of things to do. A few questions around things to do with uh, tertiary and strikes and things. So just in the past few days, there have been very interesting concerns. The, uh, the UTAG have given indication they are not very happy with certain things. What's your approach to dealing with university-level education as far as first lecturer satisfaction is concerned and other issues? I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, probably one of the few ministers who came to this office and said, my priority is tertiary education. Based on research, uh, if you're talking about medium-term transformation of this country, you have to take a close look at tertiary education. Uh, because all over the world, uh, you know, in the early 1980s, the Britain Woods institutions were convincing us to not focus on tertiary for the privileged. And, Tertiary education, they say, is a private good. It benefits the individual, not the nation. And then we blinked. And things passed by. Countries that did not blink and did not take the advice and focus on tertiary today has transformed their fortunes much better than we have done. So one big indicator is the gross tertiary enrollment ratio. If your nation has 40%, you see transformation happening in front of your eyes. Sometimes you will not believe that it is my country, things are shifting. We are 18.8%. We are nowhere close to where transformation is possible. And, and in terms of the stem to humanities, you hear all the time uh, various people saying that stem should be 60 40. Stem is uh, 60, humanities is 40. The interesting thing about this 
is that they are right that if we can focus on that and get a 60-40, we'll see some transformation. But the sad thing is that if science happens to be 12% at the senior high school level, how does it become 60%? In a country where if you do not do science, we don't allow you to pursue STEM-related careers. So, so we are in a bus, in a kind of a conundrum, how we get ourselves out of that situation to move that 60-40, bring out the gross tertiary enrollment ratio, it demands that we do some critical thinking. For example, uh, in my opinion, uh, a student who does uh, visual arts is one of the most creative minds you have. Uh, and, and unfortunately for us, we've created a system here in this country where we say, if you did visual arts, you cannot become an engineer. That the creative mind who can look at you and draw you and design bridges and vehicles and all those things, we say, no, 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 you, you come no close to engineering. My approach is this. I'm not here to talk about lower the standards for anyone. But if that student is determined, why can't we create opportunity for pre-engineering where he comes in, do the mathematics, do the fixes, with fierce determination they can, and then when they meet all the minimum requirement, they can come in and do engineering just like everybody. It may take five years for them, but at least you're giving them the opportunity. If you can get such students from business and get some students from uh, general, then you are talking about increasing your ratio to about 60%. But you also have to look at the long-term pipeline from basic schools to junior high schools to high schools where you really emphasize on the STEM. And the STEM means you're doing robotics. You're doing uh, network, uh, computer networking. You're doing engineering. You're doing all these things that is traditionally not done. And mm -hmm. that is how you create a larger footprint for STEM, which then moves up okay. into the tertiary space. Yeah, so in that space, you're going to have challenges. We have demands uh, from labor, and rightly so. People want to be rewarded uh, for the work that they do. Uh, the government is super committed uh, to do things differently. When we meet and exchange ideas, um, yeah. consensus is built around certain things. On tertiary education, a couple of points have come up. Mm -hmm. Private universities have complained that mm -hmm. they, they are not getting subsidized because they are part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So for example, Central University, I think this week or a week ago, they were, I'm told they, were, they had to pay uh, the, the old electricity bill or something like that. When I meet people from those universities, mm -hmm. they feel that mm -hmm. They are not seen as part of the solution. Mm. They are seen as private entities on their own. Mm -hmm. If you want to increase your gross tertiary enrollment from 18 to 40, you mm. would definitely need them. What's your, what's your radical idea for private tertiary institutions? Uh, this one I'll tell you. Around the world, I've seen different models. And, and in most places, uh, your subsidy is through the subsidization of the student loans. Mm. Because private university students also qualify for the student loans. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you remove barriers which enable more students to then access student loans and they are reasonable enough, reasonable enough to pay their fees, government is subsidizing them, the private institution, because the greatest barrier is the fee. Mm. A number of students don't go to a certain because of the fee. But if our student loans like has been increased, if we can increase it further and make sure that they can meet the needs of fee-paying students to private universities. Opportunity then will be created for private growth. But I, I think the most important thing is for us to also sometimes, you see, I, I don't close my mind on certain issues because if you jaw jaw and, and begin to talk to people, sometimes the ideas may not originally be yours, but you get it from them. But let me press this a bit. When private universities, for example, charge higher than public universities, mm -hmm. A clue to the fact that their fees may be realistic is that mm -hmm. when you go to a school like Legon, which is public, mm -hmm. the amount they charge fee-paying students mm -hmm. is a better reflection of the real cost of education, mm -hmm. which is similar to the private. Mm -hmm. So the private university fees may be high, mm -hmm. but that's actually the realistic cost of educating mm -hmm. a person. Mm -hmm. And somehow the student loans are much lower than those mm -hmm. amounts. So the problem hasn't been solved. Yeah, so, the, but it has, we've, we've done something. The first term of the president, look at the increase that he brought about. So what I'm saying is that as an education minister, I wish I can get more <laughs> for every student in terms of access to loans, but at least the barrier, the greatest barrier, the guarantor, uh, uh, where a number of students didn't come from families where 
uh, somebody can guarantee for them. So invariably, this is what you see. Those who come from homes where it's easier for them to get guarantors may not need a loan. The ones who need the loans the most are the ones who don't come from homes where you can get a guarantor. So when the president said that there will be a no guarantor policy, cabinet has approved it. We are now going to parliament for approval, uh, for amendment. Once parliament does that, then you have the floodgates of the student loans open to many, many, many students. So under the current dispensation, a number of people were not even assessing it because they just could not even get a guarantor to sign for them. So I think it's about removing barriers one at a time. Then we get to a point where you look at the amount mm. and then you begin to create opportunities for students to go to other institutions. But I'll tell you this, in the private school, private university environment, you see Ghana does something very innovative with uh, the affiliation. So if I'm going to a startup private school, I go there, by the time I graduate, I have a diploma or a, a certificate from Legon. When I'm going to look for a job, nobody knows the kind of school I went to. Other than mm. not, Legon mm. certificate is mm. what you are holding, mm. right? So it gave opportunity, it gave a boost for private uh, a, a university education. Mm -hmm. Now we change into a situation where the bar is being raised for startup. Okay. But when you get in, within a short period of time, you're going to get your charter. Once that is created, private universities also have to look at their brand. Okay. What brand have you created that people are willing to pay premium for it? Because in people who go to universities, they go with their eye open mm. on the opportunity at the end. Mm. So yes, uh, there's a need for us to promote and support private mm. universities. Some of them want tax breaks. They want to hear you on your feet argue for mm -hmm. tax breaks for, for them. But I want to come back to primary briefly. Mm -hmm. When we looked at the analysis of the educational system, mm -hmm. private basic schools do better than public basic schools, mm -hmm. even though public basic schools have better teachers. Mm -hmm. We are told there are two reasons for this. There's better supervision at the private schools. Mm -hmm. And there's also a feeling that the ratios, mm -hmm. so a private basic school have more students to a teacher than a, a public basic school has more. As a teacher yourself, mm -hmm. What's your offer to teachers mm. for basic schools? Mm. I know you are trying to do licensure. Mm. Teachers have opposed this. There's a laptop issue. What, what's Educhun's plan for teachers, particularly at the basic level? I'm continuing with Nana Dudan Kwaku for the vision for education and for teachers. And uh, there's no specific Educhun vision for education. I'm here as a. No, for teachers. For teachers. For I, teachers. Yeah, I, I'm a teacher in chief, as I always refer to myself. So I'm one of them. But I'm saying that uh, the vision that I'm pursuing. Is that, that no problem. So, what is the vision for teachers? The vision for teachers is look at the first thing professional allowance, right? Uh, which a new a novelty, 1,500 uh, for teachers. Out of which a portion was used in paying for the laptops. Okay, the 30% that you hear came from the allowance, which for the first time was instituted by the president. So it's not out of pocket, it's out of the allowance. Part of it were used in getting the laptops. So the president believes that we are in the 21st century. Teachers should have opportunity to use state-of-the-art equipment and, and, and stop writing these notes and, and you have to copy it. And the whole idea was that if you copy it with your hand, it means it is you who wrote it and you're going to be able to use it. 21st century, things are shifting. So the bottom line is this. Nobody is committed to the well-being of the teachers in this country more than this president. And, and, and of course, there are limitations. We're in a pandemic. Things are difficult. We have to shut down schools, bring them up, spend so much money making sure we can open schools again. So when demands come, in the middle of a pandemic. It's not easy. When we're going through negotiation with a number of labor unions, I was telling them, I feel for you, but this is almost like the worst time to do negotiations. I happen to be the minister when most of the negotiations were due and we have to go through it. And you sit there and you look at the demands and then you talk to the finance minister and he talks about the demands on the national press, minister for education, you go there, you want the best for your teachers, you advocate for your teachers. And then you go and look at the financial reality and look and say, wow, 
What do I go and tell my teachers? I care daily about them and I wish everything that they want to be given to them now. But you are so close to the financial structures, you also know the constraints. So invariably, you go and you do the dance and do whatever you have to do to get as much as you can uh, for your teachers. And that's what we've been doing. In terms what, of what do you make of the, the complaints by teachers about the one laptop, one teacher project? Uh, the, the bottom line for me is that they've been given a device that has a full complement of any other device you can find on the market mm -hmm. in terms of the memory size, in terms of speed. You see, when you, I taught uh, ICT mm -hmm. in high school in the US, so I know a bit about computers. And the most important thing to me, any computer that I'm holding in my hand, I'm going to look at the speed, the megahertz, and I'm going to look at the memory, and I'm going to look at what am I going to do with this device, and will this device enable me to do the work that I'm supposed to do? While the answers are in the affirmative, I'm, I'm good with the device. So, so the bottom line for me is that there are times when you hear genuine concerns, but there are times when you hear something that you know somebody just want to score some unknown political points from something that was well thought through. When I came here, I, I was a deputy minister. Um, I was not in So you charge. know about the project? Of course, I know about it. But you were not the one handling it? Of course. Could it have been managed better? It was managed very well under the previous minister because he did everything right by acceding to the request of the unions and saying, I want to sit down with you, what can I do with your request? And then going to government to make sure he has a 70% uh, secure so that the project can move forward. I think, in my opinion, Everything that needed to be done was done. Of course, there are a number of times that communication of a project may be your Achilles heels. Uh, it doesn't mean the project itself is not the best, but sometimes the way communication is done depends upon who is telling the story. And you know, we are in a country where everything is through the prism of politics. <laughs> so by the time you realize something that you, uh, you, you, you knew was going to serve a great purpose, can become a, uh, an albatross around your neck. But I'll tell you one thing. One thing I know is that uh, the device is good. Uh, the second thing I know is that a portion of the allowance that the president instituted is, is what we'll use for the 30%. And the government shouldered the 70%. What I have told Ghana Education Service and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the company delivering that, they better deliver on time. Because I don't understand why it should take so long okay. for the devices that are already in a warehouse to be delivered. So I was happy when I saw Prof. Bukwa Mankwa at O'Reilly Senior High School supervising distribution. We need to speed up okay. to make sure everybody has their device in their hands. You just said something that leads me to my next, which is probably my penultimate question, that everything is seen through the prism of politics. With great respect, is the government also not suffering from that? And let me explain the question. Mm. It seems as if when people criticize the educational system, mm. they are seen to also be doing politics. I'll give you an mm. example. Mm. In August 30, mm -hmm. Nat said mm -hmm. there were schools in certain regions which didn't have enough food. Mm. 1st September, people mm. sent messages to mm. some media houses, including ours, mm. saying that for saying two things, mm. they didn't like the variety of food they were getting, mm -hmm. and that in some instances, they didn't have enough food. Mm -hmm. The initial reaction of the ministry mm -hmm. was that of, we'll go and check, there's food, this is not true. Mm -hmm. In fact, some people said this was just politics. Mm -hmm. They wanted to sabotage mm -hmm. the government's secondary mm -hmm. education agenda. Mm -hmm. But by September 28, mm -hmm. Charles had come out to say mm -hmm. the system that was managing food in schools mm -hmm. wasn't the best. Mm -hmm. Then you had come to even propose a change of the system. Mm -hmm asking Charles to calm down mm -hmm. and that you will make sure that they all got food. Mm -hmm. Is this not a clear example of government also seeing what is genuine criticism and a genuine shortage mm -hmm. as political and therefore initially dismissing it? I, I'll give you an example. I went to your school. I know. Sec. I know. I went to the school one evening. I was there with them at prep time. Had a nice time with yes. the students. Very nice uh, young yeah. men. Yeah. And you know, they had reported on the news that Presec had no food. When I went there and I was interacting with them, they said, no, we've eaten today. Yeah. Everything was great. The headmaster joined me. Mm -hmm. And there and then they said, no, it cannot be true. 
But it had been on the news. Parents were trooping to Presec that their children were starving. When I went there, mm -hmm. there was nothing like that. But that's just so, one school. So, no, that one school, but why should it be even be one no, school? But, but I, no, 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 that's I'm the question just, I'm asking you. No. That if so you have about 2,000 schools no, in the country. But why like, should it be even one school? The truth is the truth. You said Presec had no food. And the reportage appeared as if the person went there and verified, right? Because no, no, what I'm saying the schools that, don't allow media to come no, no, and do I, it. I, I and you know I, no, this. No, I understand that. But if I'm going to mention anything on the internet, that Presec doesn't have food, I have to find a way to check. Because the bottom line is then we cause fear and panic among the parents. A Presec parent, a well-respected mm. uh, uh, parent sending mm. their children to Presec yeah. to hear that their children are starving. Mm -hmm. So it took, uh, I went there. I know. And so, so the bottom line had pictures of them. No, I know. <laughs> it was on your Facebook page. <laughs> yeah. So, so the bottom line for me is that it yeah. shouldn't even be one school. The bottom line is that the yeah. truth is the truth. Me, I, let me tell you, for, I've been on record. If something is not, like I'm talking about the laptop, I don't understand why they shouldn't get it in a timely fashion. If something is not true, I won't sit in front of you and make it the truth. I, I get that point. Mama, so, I, sorry to push this. I'm saying mm -hmm. that three weeks after that, mm -hmm. Your ministry said you were streamlining food supply architecture of senior high schools. To, uh, let, mm -hmm. Just give me two seconds. Mm -hmm. Please permit me. Now, you, you said this because mm -hmm. the conference of heads of assisted schools mm -hmm. had called for immediate release of funds and food items for the smooth running of schools in the country. Mm -hmm. And then they went on to say that the, the chas said that mm -hmm. if they didn't get supply of food, they will be forced to even postpone reopening. Mm -hmm. This is just three weeks. I mean, it's not, it's not because of that that I came out. It was because of the fact that I need to know. For example, I, should, I, I didn't need to go to Presec to verify. So the system that we've put in place uh, going forward is something that allows you on a dashboard to see the stock at every school. So that as a minister, once I look at the dashboard certified by the headmaster, mm -hmm. I know that, yes, we have a problem here. And then we deal with it. So I need that ecosystem that enables us to take away mm. uh, uh, the idea that there's no food in Presec when the headmaster could have certified it on their but dashboard. I, I get that you say. I agree with this. I'm saying that the graphic story, Dr. Educhum mm -hmm. appealed to heads of schools mm -hmm. to remain calm mm -hmm. while Charles furnished the ministry with mm -hmm. the names of the schools mm -hmm. in dire need of food supply for immediate action. Yes. So clearly there was a problem. No. I wanted to be on top of my game by making sure that I'm working with my colleague headmasters. And that's why I appeal for calm. If you are the leader, of the Ministry of Education, you have to appeal for calm. You can't rubbish your headmasters. No, but the, the, no, I, I, no, I, I just have to no, make sure. Charles told the graphic mm -hmm. that the food mm -hmm. situation was getting worse for mm -hmm. schools and that there was the need so, for the so government is, to, without any further delay, uh -huh. release funds to prevent some mm -hmm. of the schools from going on early break as was being contemplated. So what is the point? The My point, point is that there is, is that a problem in the schools ah, and I, we are rushing to make it seem I as if somebody has an agenda against no, the program. No, let me tell you. One thing that I know is that a number of people, when they see issues, they will call. Mm -hmm. You see, most of you will call and say, hey, Dr. Duchu, what's going on here? We are going to the press with this story. Can you give us a comment? I get it all the time. But, but when you have such a pressing issue, right, mm -hmm. and the ministry is not contacted, outside of the story, even if you don't like it, can you just give us a voice and let me say something? That's what I'm saying, my brother. All that I'm saying is that I don't mind you doing your work. Yeah. But can you, just like we all mm. work together, say, Dr. Duchum, there's a crisis in your schools. Yeah. We are going to press on this issue. All you right. have a comment. Let me say I don't have any. So when you go and say, all Dr. Right. Duchum said no comment. No right? problem. So that's what I'm we saying. We did call GS though, but I will leave that for now. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying all of this because there are media houses who feel that uh -huh. they are genuine attempts to expose the malaise of problems in the educational sector has been misconstrued. And some have even been accused of running campaigns against the program. Whereas no, it could be media doing their ordinary business. No, let me tell you. I'll tell you. I won't mention the name because they used to be my favorite media. So I, I won't. I won't. Just like you. I won't mention their name. But there was something that was going on, right? First day, there was something against Free Senior High School. We called and said, can we come? And they said, look. Second day, they repeated. Third day is when they say you can come and respond. Come on. Come on. Couldn't you have... And, and the first thing is that when the whole program started, when I called their higher-ups, 
the high apps didn't even know. They said, oh, they'll call you. Oh, this is normal. You're somebody that we've worked with. We'll call you. Then went to the third day because, before they said, you can come and respond, my brother. When this happens, you want me to say that there was nothing... But I hope now we, the media and education are partners. We are working. We are no, moving no, forward. No, no, the thing is this. I've, you see, as a deputy minister, I worked so well with the media. And I want to continue as a minister. And, and sitting down, chit-chatting. You know, some of the things that people don't know when I do interviews, I pick up so many ideas from you. <laughs> so, so I enjoy the dialogue with you. It's not a monologue. I really want to hear from you. Uh, good, bad, ugly, something in between. Mm. And then I'll, I'll take it as a sense of urgency. I go and work. We hope you'll get time to do more exponential equations. Because when, 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 you when you were deputy, <laughs> you came to teach exponential equations Equation. on class act. But I know that, it's been, in fact, since you became minister, this is the first time I've seen you physically. It means yeah. you, are, you are busier. So I don't know if you have time to still be teaching. I'll come. You'll come. I'll come. That's a promise to have oh, you. Oh, no, no, I'll come. And what subject will you teach? Maths. Maths. Of STEM. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Juma has promised to come back and continue his mathematical he lectures. Said the, he told the whole world. <laughs> so he's going to come back to continue. Come. But things have to settle. Hopefully his budget gets approved. Things start moving. And he would then come and do what he does. Thank you, Doc, for being on the program. Wish you well. Genuinely wish you well. We hope you succeed. My name is Ben Adavle. Thank you for watching another edition of The Point of View. Coming up next is the Business Dashboard. Stay with CTTV. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Choco Toothpaste. Kel Choco. Happy Smile. Bell Aqua Active. Bell Aqua Active. Stay true to originality.